welcome everybody. I'm Michael Barr, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this special celebration of the Public Policy and International Affairs Junior Summer Institute. We're here today to celebrate the 40th year of the PPIA Fellowship at the Ford School. We've proudly supported the PPIA Fellowship, formerly known as the Sloan or Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, since 1981. The Ford School is one of just a handful of policy schools to host this seven-week educational initiative for undergraduate students every summer since its inception 40 years ago. A special welcome to our current uh, PPIA students who are joining us here today. I'm really excited that they are uh, here in the Ford School uh, virtually uh, and having a chance to, to celebrate um, uh, these programs. I also wanna celebrate uh, PPIA students um, who are here with us, uh, not only um, from the Ford School, but also from Berkeley, from Carnegie Mellon, from Princeton, from the University of Maryland, and the University of Minnesota. We're thrilled to have you all here today and hope you will connect with your fellow alumni at a networking session we are hosting just after the panel discussion. To all of the former Ford School PPIA fellows, we welcome you back virtually. While we may not see you regularly, we certainly consider you a really important part of the Ford School family. I'm thrilled to get the chance today to celebrate the legacy of our PPA alumni and all they have achieved. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanna say that the Ford School remains dedicated in the future to hosting and supporting the PPA Junior Summer Institute for many years to come. We hope to ensure that the program continues for at least another 40 years. The active involvement of our PPA alumni is essential to this goal and your participation today means a great deal to me. Thanks also to all of you who have donated to the PPA program over the years. The PPA program has a long history of institutional support that made its beginnings possible. Though as the years have gone by, we've increasingly relied on individual donations to fund the Junior Summer Institute. A gift of any size truly makes a difference, and we could not do this without your help. And now let me introduce our wonderful panel of PPIA alumni uh, here for our conversation today. Farouk Afazo is a 2006 MPP graduate of the Ford School. He is the Chief of Staff in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense, the Comptroller of DOD. Mr. Afazo has over 15 years of experience in the federal budget and appropriations processes, serving in a variety of roles in the U.S. Congress, the White House, Office of Management Budget, and the U.S. Air Force. Dr. Kanita Williams is a 2007 MPP graduate of the Ford School. Kanita is the Chief of Staff for the Southern Education Foundation. In her role, Kanita works to strengthen existing programs, supports the work of the president and CEO, and leads key strategic initiatives for impact. And lastly, Dr. David C. Wilson is the dean of our sister school, the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Wilson is a political psychologist specializing in the use of survey-based instruments to study political behavior and policy preferences. His scholarship focuses on the psychology of political opinion about policies, contentious social issues, and political figures. Before we begin, a couple of quick notes about format. We'll have some time at the end of today for some audience questions. We've received some in advance, but you can also submit questions in the live chat on YouTube, or you can tweet your questions to hashtag policy talks. With that, let me just say I'm really excited um, to be joined by our wonderful panelists, um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So if you could bring them all up on screen, we'll get started. Uh, Farouk, David, Kanita, another warm welcome to the panel today. Thank you so much for participating with all of us. It's just uh, delightful to have you here, and I, I know everybody's super busy in this time, so I'm, I'm extra thankful. The PPIA program is really near and dear to my heart, and um, I've loved getting to know the students who have come through the program. I'm wondering if each of you could say a little bit about, if you can recall back to this time, 
what caused you to apply to the program in the first place? And uh, maybe we'll start with um, with David and then Farouk and Kanita. Yeah, thank you and, and congratulations on 40 years. And uh, Michael, thanks for your leadership and to all of your staff, thank you and all the students. Uh, congratulations on on getting into the world of public policy. It's, it's, a, it's an important time to study the issues that we study and public policy is a way for you to commit yourself to the public good. And ironically, this is how I got interested in, in what I thought was just the study of government. So I, I was a government major in my undergraduate years, and I was very much interested in, in how the government makes decisions and if there are public problems, how it solves those problems. And I never thought about public policy. I just thought about what I saw on television, which was leaders. So leaders decide. And uh, I ignored the mechanisms by which they use to decide and all of the inputs that go into that decision-making process and all of the science behind those mechanisms as well. So, um, so I was exposed to this idea of a Woodrow Wilson program in the early 1990s. And when I applied and got into it, I was just drawn into this, this community of folks that cared about solving public issues and wanted to use the tools of public policy. I love data, I love talking about the issues, thinking about solutions, and then proposing one and, and doing that kind of back and forth to see which one we'd select, and then going all in on trying to make it successful. So that's how I got exposed to the program and why I got interested. Thanks for the question. Thanks, David. Um, Farouk? Yeah, I, I just want to also reiterate all of the congratulations uh, and also the thank, thank you for uh, having us here and hosting us today. Um, I, I, I just want to say I have a very similar recollection. Um, I completed the program in 2002, um, 19 years ago. So it's a little bit hard to remember it all. But I, I also did have an interest in government and in history. And um, a lot of folks told me, well, that means you should just go to law school. But I knew that there was another, there had to be another way. Uh, there had to be another way to serve the public um, and, and to work on really interesting topics. So I was really drawn to policy issues uh, more than more than really anything else. I sort of had a high level understanding of policy issues and that's what really piqued my interest in public policy in general. So when I first heard about the program, um, I applied, I'm not thinking very much of it. I, you know, I, I didn't know really a lot of uh, detail. This was uh, 2002. I don't think there was even a website for PPIA. So, um, Anyhow, I, uh, when I um, was accepted and, and joined the program, it was you know, quite an experience we can get into. But uh, anyway, that, that was really uh, how I was drawn to the program. Thanks, Farouk. And I will um, echo um, both David and Farouk. Um, thank you and congratulatory wishes on this momentous event. I'm really grateful to be participating. Um, I have much less intentionality <laughs> than my colleagues around um, how it happened for me. It was really serendipity. I um, was a junior at Yale and I just happened to be out in the courtyard talking to a friend who was a year ahead of me. And she was asking me what I was doing that summer and I was like, I don't know, I'm looking at programs here and there. And she was like, well, I know you're a poli sci major like me. I had this great program that I par just participated in. She actually had participated at Cal. Um, um, and I said, oh, I should look into it. But I you know, I knew I didn't want to go to Cal because I'm, I'm from the Bay, so I didn't want to be home. I knew I didn't want to go to Princeton because I went to Yale. So I was like, oh, Michigan is an option. Let's see what it's about. Um, and it really was the probably one of the most formative and quite frankly, transformational experiences that I've had in terms of my career. But it was it was very much luck. Um, I was very fortunate to be in the courtyard that night. That's that's great, Kanita. Uh, <laughs> so many things in life are that way, right? Mm -hmm. Just like being being in that moment. Maybe we'll pick up where you left off and we'll go in the other order. Kanita, can you say a little bit about why, what about the program led to this big impact? Were there particular experiences that you had that that um, helped launch you on the next phase? Yeah, so um, like I said, it was really transformational. Um, 
really kind of, it might even sound a, a, a bit um, trite or cliche, but I, I really feel like it changed my life, uh, at least my career trajectory, mm -hmm. because it is, in fact, the sole reason that I knew I was going to apply to University of Michigan um, for my MPP. And so, and that, in fact, changed everything and it exposed me to new career paths um, that I wasn't really aware of. It, it equipped me with some skills and competencies for a number of different roles. Um, it actually, um, I think in a lot of ways makes me much better at my job um, and that I have a, a systemic view of looking at the equities of issues that we're focused on. And, I, you know, I'll just plug um, PPIA in a, in a lot of ways, because I also, um, before recently being promoted, I was our director of leadership development and ran mm -hmm. fellowship programs. Um, and in high, I didn't know this at the time. I just knew I was having a good time. I was learning and I was going to be paid to do so. <laughs> um, but in a lot of ways, um, PPIA is quite exemplary, like really a paragon um, um, in terms of fellowship programs and really marrying those type of experiences, networking, hearing from thought leaders, um, practical application, um, building that uh, and fostering that peer network or community of practice that is equity oriented. Um, mm -hmm. And so I actually borrow a lot as I think about how to make our own fellowship programs better. That's that's wonderful to hear. I mean, I as I said, I, 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 I kind of have a uh, love affair with this program. I just think it's so cool, and it's great to hear that um, that it connected with you in that in that way. Um, Peruk, um, how about you? Yeah, I, I would say um, in two ways. Um, the first the first uh, thing I would mention is that I think it gave me the program really gave me some confidence, especially in my quantitative ability. Um, I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, and I avoided math classes. I actually didn't need to take any to graduate as a history major. So I avoided economics, statistics, anything <laughs> that had to do with math. Um, huh. I was intimidated, you know, uh, but I knew that going through PPIA would force me to, to really rely on those skills. And so I think, uh, you know, that, that confidence was really what was really important to me. And that's really led me down this career path of you know, the last 15 years working on the federal budget um, and, and appropriations in general. That's not yeah, it sounds like you really flipped from, I mean, if you were a math phobe, you went and you chose the wrong field because you're like all, all, all in on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, I, I love Excel now. Yeah, it's like my favorite <laughs> Microsoft program. Um, but yeah, it, it really did completely. I mean, I, I, I avoided that and now it's my career um, and I love it. It's been it's been fantastic. Um, the second thing I want to say, too, is that, you know, as a young person, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, I was 20, you know, it, it was a, a space that allowed me to explore my interests. So, you know, yeah, I was interested in domestic issues. I was also interested in international issues. And at PPIA, through little seminars, we got exposure to all of it. We talked mm -hmm. about, you know, poverty in the U.S. We talked about human rights issues. We talked about everything. Um, and it gave me a chance to really uh, figure out what it, what it was that I was interested in. So I would say that those are the two sort of reasons that uh, the program has changed the trajectory of my career. Thanks, Farouk. Um, that's pretty powerful. Um, David? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll start with something Kanita kind of slid in there. Had a good time. Uh, yeah, I had a great time. I, I came up to Michigan and, and little short stories. I had, I had broken my foot. Uh, so I had surgery and I had a pen. I was on crutches. And so I spent the first half of the summer on crutches and, wow. and, and it was a, it was a huge campus. So you're trying to get around and you, you know, you do these things. So you learn the shortcuts, you get on the shuttles and the buses and invariably they pass, you know, a bar on one of the streets or something. So we get out and just kind of lunchtime, just kind of take a little sidetrack. But the West Quad, we stayed in, we had great parties and it was a great time. We got to know people in other programs in the summertime. So the, the most memorable thing about my summer there was all the communities that were in the West Quad and other places mm -hmm. on campus that you got to know and you got to experience. And I went to, I went undergrad to Western Kentucky University, this small regional recruiting school um, that, you know, really wasn't connected or, or I wasn't an academic star. I just had an interest and a passion for wanting to do something different and being around other people that had the same interests, but really cared about their academics is what really changed mm. my trajectory. And 
I was I was writing down trying to think about the people who were in the program with me. Some of them, not all of them, are in public uh, work now. Uh, some are. One is an award-winning director. Uh, Christine huh. Swanson is hmm. is out there directing movies and and being awarded for it. We have a couple of people in the State Department who I have seen that are doing public work, and some I have a judge friend who was in the program, and then all of the people that I met that were just Michigan students that were huh. just around created a whole new network for me and helped me think about what I wanted to do next. So the community piece and the having a good time was was my first exposure to, oh, you can do both of them? I thought there's just the fun people <laughs> and the smart people. I didn't know there were smart, fun people or fun, smart people. And so, uh, so I enjoyed my time there in Michigan. And I think Michigan was a special place uh, to be exposed to all of this. Uh, you know, Berkeley's, you know, good. Princeton was good. You know, the other places that were, they're good. But Michigan changed, really did change my experience and, and what I wanted to do in life. Can I, can I also just say that the program really um, helped me prepare for the, the humidity in D.C. So <laughs> as, a, as a kid from California, my first experience walking out of the Detroit airport and that blast of humidity, I'll never forget. Um, so that was another way. The summer heat. David, it's, it sounds like, have you kept up, David, with your, it sounds like you've kept up a little bit with some of the alumni from your PPIA group? Uh, a, a good core of them. Some of them you, you lose touch with and then they come back yeah. and like, thank God for social media, because that's how uh -huh. we kind of find each other. And the, the uh, Woodrow Wilson used to send out a, uh, the directory uh, a couple of years ago or maybe a decade ago. And I try and find people and stay in touch. And uh, so maybe about a third of the group, uh, we yeah. still stay in touch and have a small LinkedIn group. And the likes. Nice. Kanita and Farouk, are you also connected with your some of your um, peers from that time? Just a few. And it, as David said, it's social media. Like people uh -huh. just randomly find, find you. Um, but I also am not a big social media person. So I bet if I were more active, I could find more people. But a few of them, um, we stayed connected. Same, yeah. And I think what's been interesting about the, the group is sort of where everybody has gone and what everybody's mm -hmm. done with it. How, how they've interpreted their PPIA experience and uh, and see what they've turned that into. Um, so there's a lot of folks still in public service, um, not very many in my group in, in the federal government, uh, but a lot in public service. Mm -hmm. People have gone to the private sector into academia. So it, it's been great to see that. You know, that, that um, does suggest that there are lots of different paths people take afterwards. And, and even just the three of you have had, you know, very different career paths um, since your time at PPIA. I wonder if you could, it's, it's hard for students if you kind of put your head back where it was thinking as you were a rising senior to think forward what the possibilities are. I wonder if you guys could each just take a little bit of time and say, how you navigated those first, you know, moves to get to where you are today, because you're all extremely accomplished in your careers. But um, those first steps are hard ones to take. So I, I wonder, maybe Farouk, Farouk, you could lead us off, and then we'll we'll change up. You know, how you kind of get started uh, on the path. Sure, I think um, it might be hard to hear, but I hear this. But I think. Um, it, you almost want to take the first opportunity or at least whatever that opportunity is um, up front. Not maybe not the first one, but it's hard to be picky, you know, when you're sort of new and you're out there and, and, and let's say you have a really strong and let's say you want to be a foreign service officer. Mm -hmm. You want to join the State Department. You want to represent the country abroad. Well, th that job is extremely difficult to get. You know? And so um, you could tr certainly try, go for it. But there are a lot of careers that are sort of tangential to that. There are some that that you know you can kind of do similar work, or at least it's a gateway uh, into that career. So I would say first, you know, um, broaden your expectations, uh, mm -hmm. widen them a little bit, find opportunities that are tangential, that are similar. Um, and so I think that would be sort of the one thing is sort of really think about what it is that you want to do, but also. Um, you know, aim high, but also, you know, make sure that there's other ways to, to achieve that goal. Um, the, I, I can't, I also want to emphasize the importance of networking too in, in that area that you want to go into. Um, a lot of my 
uh, a lot of the jobs that I've had have got I've gotten through networking. Um, many people are also, for example, interested in working for Congress and working on the Hill. And I've had three different jobs on the Hill, and each each one I've had, I've I've um, gotten through networking, and I and that's just the nature of of Congress. And so the importance of um, broadening your the way you're thinking about your what you want to get into, but also your network, I, I would say, are are really important to start. Farouk, could you just walk folks through the first like two or three jobs that you had coming out of that from starting after that PPIA experience so people sure. get a sense of the trajectory? Sure. After PPIA, I actually, um, after I graduated uh, with my bachelor's degree, I decided to work um, for a couple of years because I wasn't ready for graduate school. I wanted to do some, you know, work, wanted to work. I wanted to explore the possibility of going to law school. So I worked at a law firm, um, and the law firm was a public interest firm. So they, the lawyers there worked on social security disability issues, they worked with homeless veterans, worked on immigration issues, for example. I thought that would be a great way to figure out, was I interested in the policy? Was I interested in the legal stuff? And I learned um, that I wanted to do more of the policy work. In fact, I was really interested in social security issues hmm. from that job. So I thought, okay, well, it's policy school that I really want to go to. And so that's how I ended up at the Ford School. So that was my very first job after my undergraduate degree. Uh, and, then I and then I completed my master's degree at Michigan. And then I was a PMF, a presidential management fellow. Mm -hmm. And my very first job um, was with the Air Force. I was a cost analyst. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> diving into my fears by, by um, yeah. an incredibly quantitative job. My job really was to figure out how much the Air Force's um, satellite programs would cost. So. Many people are a lot, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for example, the the GPS program. Everybody uses GPS in their car and, and everything. Um, that was one of the programs that I worked on early on, where my job was to, as a you know, fresh out of graduate school, GS nine, uh, look to look at the, that satellite program, the GS three, GPS three, um, and figure out how much it was going to cost. So that way, the Air Force could defend their request. Uh, to the senior leadership of the Air Force, to the Department of Defense, and therefore, and then eventually to Congress. So that was, and then from there, really, my career just so, sort of evolved, and I um, thought about a lot about um, the kinds of experiences I wanted, and it took a lot of patience and a lot of follow up, but eventually, um, sort of ticking off little boxes I thought I would need to sort of end up where I am now. So getting Hill experience, working in the executive branch, working at the White House, and so on. So. That's great, Farouk. Thanks. Really helpful. And that GPS investment turned out to be pretty, pretty critical <laughs> for the human human society. <laughs> um, Kanita, do you want to go next and say a little bit about maybe those first steps you took and some advice for for current PPA students? Sure. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. and I feel like my steps are ordered in, in a lot of ways and, and that things have just happened for me in a way that I have not necessarily designed them myself. Um, but um, right after college, um, I did Teach for America. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, TFA has this huge network um, and really um, put me on the path to be in this space of, of what I say is really working on um, helping make sure that we are not continuing to perpetuate systems, practices, policies that advantage some while keeping others situated further from opportunity. So that has been kind of my path. Um, and I've done a lot of things um, along that line. And so after TFA, I actually, I taught for three years in Atlanta, Georgia, hmm. and then I came to Michigan um, to do my MPP and um, actually had some doors open right away. Um, I actually took a law school class while hmm. I was there and the professor actually connected me to someone in Senator Obama's office. So I worked huh. in Senator Obama's office um, for a while and then actually came back to um, Michigan to do a fellowship um, with the Council mm -hmm. of Michigan Foundations, and mm -hmm. they actually found me um, in the Ford School um, career book. Huh. Um, so really a lot of opportunity directly related to being um, in, at the Ford School, and that has really been my path. I've, I've kind of stayed at this nexus of philanthropy, um, policy, um, equity, that kind of either directly in there or, or tangentially connected. Um, and so Worked um, TFA, masters, 
the hill back to Michigan, um, came and did um, some work actually doing public policy work for philanthropy for about five years, where I was actually building um, the capacity of grant makers and funders to be able to engage in public policy because it's still by and large uh, uncharted territory um, and are largely misunderstood because of, you know, nonprofit statuses that are <laughs> that are at risk. And so I did that for a while mm -hmm. um, and then went back to a school district and then came to SCF about almost five years ago. Um, it's done a number of things in that way. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I think um, contrary to popular belief, you actually don't need to know who you want to be when you grow up, when you graduate from college. Um, I, I, and I you think can. Was probably still are figuring that out. Um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, and, and I also believe you don't um, necessarily know who you are until you know who you're not. So you just mm -hmm. have to try things. I mean, granted, I'm very much. Um, in the reality that bills need to be paid. So you probably do need a job, but you can actually try different things. Um, and so my advice would be to do that. And also um, my friends would say, I'm a serial joiner, fellowshipper. Um, I'm in a number of <laughs> civic organizations. I've done a number of different fellowships because they just expose you um, to different opportunities and to different networks. Um, then, you know, mentorship. I don't, I don't think we can, um, like underscore the importance of just mm -hmm. having good old fashioned mentors. Mm -hmm. um, they're just critical. They have been still critical for me. And then just good old fashioned informational interviews, like talk to people who are in in the jobs that you feel like you want to go into and, and just really leverage those opportunities. Um, and you'll be surprised what opens up um, for you. That's great. Um, Kenita, maybe I can just ask you to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the mentorship point, because I do think that's so critical. But there's a lot of tacit knowledge in yeah. how to have a mentor, how to be a mentor. Yes, also, yeah. but how to, how to get a mentor. Could you just say a little bit about how you think about that? Well, you know, it's interesting because it is, um, you know, being on this side of the work, I understand just the importance of social and cultural capital and then how many kids don't come to schools um, with those type of things. So they don't have access to the people who are, are doing those type of jobs and um, and don't know, um, you know, kind of those soft skills or the, the social kind of steps that you need to take to get those things. So um, and I was one of those. I just like I said, I've been very fortunate to kind of luck into things and have people, um, you know, for whatever reason, think I'm smart and they want to get to know me. Um, and, for whatever and, reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I had people who actually um, wanted to sew into me. And so mm -hmm. like my first actual mentor was someone that actually reached out to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I kind of was like, oh, I get I get this and, and really be thoughtful about it. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the programs that I've been in also, too, like they have mentorship um, as part of the fellowships that we're doing. So um, I, I can't say that I had any um, science or art behind um, doing it, but just was very fortunate and people wanting to sew into me. But now I am very intentional about helping um, young folks. I guess I'm still I'm 40, so I'm relatively dependent on what field you're in. I'm still young, um, but um, really be thoughtful about how do you do that and how do you how do you navigate those relationships and how you nurture them and understand that it is a partnership. It should be symbiotic. You may not be giving as much, but you need to be um, you know respectful and nurture the time of the person that's investing into you. Thanks, Kanita. Mm -hmm. Um, David, do you want to go next and, you know, a little bit about those first steps you took and advice for our, the current uh, PPA students? This is fascinating. This is, you know, the, the threads that run through all of this. You know, when I when I left uh, the public policy program, it was 1993. And the one thing that it gave me uh, that helped me throughout was confidence, right, that you're, you're going in there you get in the trenches a little bit, you know, on the academic stuff and you get the, the support through the social and community. But when you come out of there, you know, you have some sense of knowing that you can do this stuff. You know, and, and it wasn't just the academics. It was this stuff is something you can do as a job, as an interest. And it doesn't have to be work. It can be something that's aligned with what you do well or what you're passionate about in some ways. 
And so when I came back from the summer, I was very focused because mm. I had been exposed to this whole new world mm. and it gave me some direction. It motivated me to think about things in a different way. And so I decided to go to graduate school. I mean, I actually, I should, I should be honest with you. I took a job, I came back and I took a job working for the Martin Luther King Federal Holiday Commission. Hmm. And uh, people don't know this, but the King holiday was a national holiday before it was a federal holiday. And there was actually a commission that helped get the federal holiday established. And I was one of the five people on that commission hmm. as a legislative uh, aide. And so that was great. It was wonderful. I got to work in Atlanta and I had an office in D.C. and traveling. Mm. So it was kind of like being a lobbyist, but not being a lobbyist. And it was fascinating. But I had so much fun. I spent all my money. And it was Atlanta. It was D.C. You're going to spend all your money. <laughs> and he was like, OK. And I thought I was smarter than my bosses were. So I said, that's too much confidence. But I said, I want to go to graduate school and study this stuff and get better at it. And it led me to uh, Michigan State University and right down the road from it all. Mm -hmm. And uh and once I got to Michigan State, I got exposed to more stuff, data and different ways of looking at the data and different ways of being in the room and having a different kind of conversation because you could speak data language and stats talk. And I learned that math and stats were not the same thing, right? That statistics is really a general way to think about finding patterns in information. And the statistics is just a formal way of expressing it and quantifying it. But if you like looking for patterns and being strategic about how to alter or adjust those patterns, boom, then, then doing research and analysis is there. And, and it, it just led me into academia. I worked for uh, SPSS. My real first job out of grad school was for SPSS, training people to use the product. Once again, I thought I was smarter than they were. Uh, it wasn't true, but that's how you convince yourself to do new stuff. I got hired by Gallup and I worked for 10 years at the Gallup uh -huh. organization in Washington, D.C. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I was in the military. So I joined the Army Reserve like in high school, you know, the mm. commercial about paying for college. It, it, you know, it's another story, but it, it, they don't really pay for college. They just give you some side money. And uh, and uh, Iraqi freedom kicked off in 2003 and I was mm. working in D.C. and hadn't gotten out of the military yet. So I was deployed for a year in Iraq and other parts of the, the area hmm. and came back and just just didn't have a passion for the kind of work I was doing. That led me to go into academia and I've loved it ever since. The freedom to think about issues, the freedom, the, the freedom to help strategize about how to help young people and people who are mid-career think about what they want to do next and how to have impact and to sell the story of, of public policy and the social sciences to anybody who will listen because it's something that actually sparked my curiosity and changed my life. So, so academia is another route you can take to, to do your professional work, but also help other people think about what we should be doing next. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what I've, the last nine years I've been in administrating, uh, administrative roles, doing dean's work, and, and now I'm here at Berkeley working uh, with the Golden School. Thanks, David. Just a, a fantastic and really interesting career path. And I think all three of you have had, again, such different routes. I think it helps. It's a little freeing, I think, for students to know that you don't have to follow a straight line and know, as, as Kanita said, when you're born, you know, what you're going to do when, you're, um, when, you, when you get uh, later in your career. I, I wonder if we could reflect a little bit on your different kinds of views of leadership um, in the next next segment. Um, we've been trying to build out, we are building out the leadership side of what we teach our students. Uh, we and, and Berkeley's the same way have long been known for our, our strong quantitative training. And that that's a really important foundation to be a leader. Obviously, you know, we have, too often leaders who don't know anything say things, and that's not really that helpful. So definitely having a strong analytic foundation is really critical, but there are lots of other skills that you know, students need to, to have to be successful in leadership over their careers. And um, we're building those into our, into our um, leadership activities here. I wonder if you, you could each reflect a little bit on your sense of what leadership skills you've acquired, you know, how you've acquired them, what you think is important in leadership. And 
uh, Kanita, maybe I'll start with you and then I'll go around. So um, it's interesting. So I um, actually just defended my dissertation last week. Um, so that is how I'm officially. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, but my um, my uh, field is entrepreneurial leadership and education, and I'm looking at racial equity. And so I've actually studied and looked at leadership quite a bit um, over the last few years and really, um, I, you know, came across a quote that leadership is one of probably one of the most studied phenomenon, but most under, misunderstood phenomena that we have, um, because I think there are just tons of misconceptions around leadership and, and what it is. And I had that and, and really um, what I thought was a leader was akin to really just being a boss. And it was about um, extrinsic motivation, sticks and carrots, compliance, you do what I say. Um, and that's not leadership at all. Um, leadership is much more about um, social influence um, and um, motivating people to work toward a common goal. And you do that by um, speaking to their intrinsic values and, and making them feel um, that you actually care about them and that you inspire them. And also being um, a model uh, of a leader, rolling up your sleeve and actually exhibiting what it is that you want from those that you lead. Um, and if you're a true leader, people are um, themselves better off and better leaders as a, as a result of having been led by you. Um, and so these are things that really go into how I try to approach my leadership, particularly um, in my new role in my organization. Um, and, you know, just really being thoughtful about actually listening. A listening leader um, is key. Listening to understand, um, actually realizing that I don't have the, all the answers and knowing that and that actually you have good people on your team for a reason. So they should have some of the answers, if not all the answers for you. Um, and so. Um, you know, those type of things are really coming into play until how I shape and hone my own leadership. Um, and um, leaders continue to learn um, and, and learn how to be better leaders and evolve. Um, and so that is what I would offer. Thanks, Kanita. That's great. Great advice. Um, David, you know, you and I are now sharing the same kind of job. It's a, it's a different kind of leadership job, certainly than I've had before. Um, academics, academic leadership is a different kind of leadership. But I wonder if if you could reflect a little bit on your experiences, both, both at Delaware and now at, at the Goldman School in, in uh, leadership, and, and maybe also on your service um, uh, in the Army, which probably influenced your, your thinking about leadership as well. Yeah, uh, you, you find bad leaders really quickly in the Army, unfortunately. Anyway, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, the, I, I mean, I agree with, a lot with what Kanita said in terms of skill sets, uh, listening, listening with intention, making sure that other people feel valued and are a part of the team. We, we talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but but inclusion, you have to be really active and intentional about it, making sure that their voices are included in every conversation. And you hear people talk about community in our campus, but there's always people excluded around these boundaries of, of academics and disciplines and the like, and you have to be more inclusive in order to really grow and do things. But the, the one thing I would say is that uh, the most important investment you can make in leadership is knowing thyself, knowing something mm. about you. What are your skills? Uh, use the tools that are out there to help identify your strengths and your traits that really make you who you are and use a team. Mentors are good, uh, but assessment tools are as well to help understand what do you do well? What resonates with people that you have? What do you bring to the table that you can invest uh, in? And, and by really focusing on you, if you can lead yourself in that direction of studying you, having a vision for you and having a mission statement for you, then you could maybe convince some other people they should follow you. Mm. And so the, the leadership piece is, you know, this is it's true. There is no one definition. Um, and you've got to constant, constantly be prepared for change. And that means understanding others, being able to listen and being able to know whether or not you're a good responder to change and not everybody is. So investing in yourself uh, before you try to go out there and ask people to do other things for you and do what they have. Thanks, David. That's that's great advice. So we, we do this. We say the same thing at the Ford School. You got to learn how to lead yourself, learn how to lead others. And then you can talk about leading organizations once you've yeah. got a, a good foundation. 
And, and people lead from lots of different places in the organization. You don't have to be by any means running a place to be leading it. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one of the most, just really quickly, one of the most powerful things. So I went to, went to Iraq in the fall of 2003 and we had a, a general that sat down a small group of us. We, I was part of a team that actually recruited and built the new Iraqi army in the fall of 2003. Mm -hmm. And he came in the room and he said, I know I'm the person with the highest rank, but there's no monopoly on good ideas. And so you can imagine for the first time us kind of hearing that saying, you actually want to hear what we have to say. <laughs> And in uh -huh. that way, he, that person gained a lot of respect in a very mm -hmm. difficult time period and a mm -hmm. very difficult task that will have an ability to just give voice. So you don't have to be in a role and you and the person that is in the role has to communicate that out. So it's very good. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Farouk, what are your thoughts on on leadership? Um, so I, I haven't studied leadership. So <laughs> can you, uh, you have to check me if I say something crazy. Um, but um, no, well, I think what I can say here is based, just really based on my, my experience working for some pretty fabulous leaders in the federal government um, and some of the skills that they possess, maybe, I don't know if that's helpful. Uh, but I think um, some of the best leaders that I've worked for have been incredibly humble people, people who are, um, I wanna say likable, but I know that sometimes that term is coded. And, and so just people who um, are well respected and that comes through a lot of different ways, you know, whether it's their experience, um, whether it's something they did like sit a group of people down and, and listen to them for the first time um, and that sort of thing. I think in the government, um, somebody who's really focused on, on teamwork, uh, that they, they're you know, recognizing that they're part of a team, a much larger team and lots of different concentric circles of teams um, and, and being able to work work properly in that way. Somebody who's an amazing negotiator, um, mm -hmm. somebody who can, in every way, I mean, not just, not like these people have, not like you have to be a great negotiator on, on like a treaty, but also negotiating what room we're gonna have a meeting in, or who's gonna be in the room and that sort of thing. So I, I think, I feel like in the government, those are sort of some of the skills that have made um, really great leaders. Thanks, Farouk. Um, we're getting a lot of audience questions in, so I'm gonna start weaving those into our conversation. Um, one question from the audience is, in the course of your careers, how have you resolved conflicts in professional settings? Have you ever needed to do something that does not align with your personal beliefs or values? And maybe Farouk, if you could start us out on that question. Sure. Um Yes, uh, there's definitely, um, it's, conflict is not easy uh, in the workplace at all. Um, a lot of people come to work um, in different places. They've, their home life is different. Their, um, you know, how they sort of have grown up. So people come to the workplace um, from various backgrounds. And so um, first off, and I will say in the federal government, conflict management has, you know, there are certain uh, you know, offices and, and sort of official ways to address conflict. So obviously those those tools exist. But um, I would say, you know, having a good understanding that um, in the event of a conflict, having an understanding of, of where folks are coming from is uh, incredibly important. Um, and not just where they're coming from, from the professional standpoint, but also uh, even, even personally. Um, and so I think that's sort of one way to, to better work with conflict is to understand um, people in general. Um, I think a lot of conflict sort of comes from poor communication as well, um, whether that's a staffer communicating upward or a boss communicating downward. So I think looking at how you're communicating with people, even whether it's tone, um, whether it's in person or on e in email, um, so I think that's sort of another area, you know, when, when there is conflict to figure out, was the communication clear and consistent? Is that what's leading to conflict? And I'm, in my experience, a lot of the time it's, it's about poor communication. Hmm. Um, so it, those are just some things off the top of my head that I can uh, say on, in terms of conflict management. Thank, thanks, Farouk. Um, Kanita, how about you? Either either personal conflict question or or sort of internal conflict where you might have to do something you personally don't agree with. What do you um? What's your experience been? 
Yeah. So I've been, um, again, very fortunate where I haven't had um, any roles that have really um, pushed me or asked me to do anything that didn't align with um, my beliefs and values. Um, because, you know, I, like I said, I, I know I have a path and, and, and what I'm working on and, and my jobs typically align with that. Hmm. Um, that said, that does not mean that um, conflict does not arise in the world. Place. I think it's a natural um, thing. Um, I think one of the things that um, that came to me later after this leadership, when we were talking about leadership um, earlier, is really um, the importance of emotional intelligence and and really taking time to hone EQ. Um, I think mm -hmm. um, you know hard skills, uh, talent get you in the door and help you do a good job in your job. But whether you are successful and thrive in a particular culture, I think is largely um, tied to how you are, um, and how you show up as a person. And that's not to say something places are just not toxic and you need to get out. That does happen. Um, but also um, being able to um, self-regulate um, and understand where you are and how you show up and um, and forecast kind of, you know, mm -hmm. like really kind of tangible, concrete strategies that you have for managing you um, and managing relationship and others are, are very important when it comes to conflict um, resolution. I think also, I think Farouk was saying just communication, like we talked about listening earlier, are you actually listening? Um, and not just listening, but hearing <laughs> what the other person is saying to you? Um, are we, um, I think oftentimes we don't always separate issues from personalities. You have to be able to to do that. Um, and um, we don't always keep it in mind. Kenita, I think we're having a little audio problem. Um, so I'm going to come back to you um, and we'll pick up with David and, and hopefully the audio will get resolved. Okay. Um, David? Yeah. Uh, in terms of resolving conflict, I mean, probably the first three or four years, what did I do? All the wrong things. Uh, <laughs> because I was focused on resolving the conflict uh, in that moment and not thinking about the problems that led to the conflict mm. in the first place. And, and in many times, you have to think about, as a leader, whether you're the right person to be trying to solve uh, problems that just come up. Maybe you should delegate some of that to someone else. And that's a skill you kind of have to, you have to take into consideration. You know, we, we, in academia, you know, everybody's important, everybody's brilliant. Uh, and then there are these rules that exist where people have rights and privileges. And so you're, you're balancing all of that. So sometimes time will fix things. And sometimes you have to do a, you know, a strong intervention on the more serious, serious things, but conflicts are just everywhere, just waiting to happen. And the key thing is to try and eliminate those areas uh, at the beginning by communicating what's what the values are, what the standards are. When I start a committee or something, I always, the first meeting, I say, okay, so how are we going to operate? What are our rules for this committee? What, how are we going to interact with one another? You know, do you want, you want to encourage disagreement or should we shy away from it? You know, as long as we're clear on the rules, that should be our guiding post. And when something happens outside of that, then we can say, hey, we agreed on this. And if we can't do that, then it might not be useful to kind of proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to, to, to say is going against your, your values. And this is, you know, I'm a behaviorist. So I study people and stuff like that. It's really tricky. Uh, as soon as you study them, they start changing. And then you got to figure out what to do next. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you're always having to make decisions because as a leader, many times your loyalty is not to your own values. Your loyalty is to the organization, the institution, the rules that you've agreed to, the policies, your mandate, your higher authority, whatever it is. And you're constantly weighing that going against uh, your values and that happens. And the best thing in anybody who thinks they can get through work or life without you know that kind of cross pressure, I got a bridge in uh, you know the desert that's uh, cheap. But but the, the bottom line is find ways to prepare yourself for when you gotta make those tough choices. And when you do something you know that's boring on, you know, crossing the line in your mind, be prepared just for whatever consequences of doing it or not doing it are and learn to live with them. That's 
that's the best advice you can offer is that if you, you know, in, in academia, you get scholar advocates and you want to push the needle and push the button. And unfortunately, we have a tier system where not everybody's protected. And even if you are protected, you're not protected from the person that can just show up at your door randomly and, and tell you how they feel about your work. So you do have to always um, uh, be thoughtful about your actions and set uh, in place some, some protections, but also some ways to, uh, you know, give some give, give and take a little bit. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever you decide to do that goes against your values, find some way to balance that out with something else. And that may help you get through it. Thanks, David. Um, as I said, we have lots of questions, so I might just do ask one of you to do uh, each of the um, each of the next ones. I'm I'm gonna turn to um, David. Why don't I turn to you next? Because this is a question that you and I deal with in our day jobs, and I'm sure Farouk and Kanita do too. But but very specifically, uh, how do we encourage a new and diverse generation to go into public policy? given the current political climate. So maybe David, you could take that on. Yeah, uh, I, 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 one, I, I collect data on what they see as their interest areas and then mm -hmm. try and align kind of programs and give instruments for the programs to kind of get them there. You know, if, if it's tools you need to solve problems, we can identify tools, but we also need to have curriculum that exposes people to the problems. Because in many ways, sometimes the problems that you look at are just in your own community, mm -hmm. but the real problem in the world is completely different. And so you need to have the tools to understand the big problem so the, the community local one doesn't exist. And so I think exposing people with, student, uh, with tools and curriculum uh, in the classroom and outside the classroom, applied learning stuff is, is the best route. Thanks, Thanks David. Um, Farouk, um, Maybe I'll ask you to take on this one. Um, there, there are lots of different formulations of this, but there are a lot of questions about what advice you would give to your younger self. What do you wish you could tell yourself back when you were a PPIA student? Oh gosh, this one's uh, this one's really hard. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I think um, you want to put punt to Kanita, and I'll get you a different one. <laughs> uh, if anybody else has it, no, I, I, you know, I, it, it's hard. It's hard to really think back, and um, you know, part, partly because I've really enjoyed the path I've been on, mm -hmm. um, and obviously I've made mistakes, and there's definitely a lot of things I wish I had known, um, you know, back back in 2002. Uh, just none, none of it's coming to my mind right now. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, if you, or David, if you have anything, um, feel free to chime in. Um, you know, that it is a, a tough question. I, one of the things that I would have um, said, or just some of the things that um, we talked about earlier, um, really taking advantage of mentors, trying new and different things. Um, one of the things um, that since I do emerging kind of emerging kind of leaders, fellows with graduate and undergraduates thing, um, students, communications, I would have told myself to really work on um, understanding the importance of communications, both written, um, oral communications, and taking opportunities, really seizing and seeking out opportunities to do public speaking, um, to write, because those things are so critical right now. So that is the one thing that I would have told myself. I think, fortunately, the, the Ford School really shapes you into a great writer. And, and I know Michael didn't pay me to say that, um, but it really does. Um, and so I feel like I've been in programs to do that, but I could have done so much more on my own. And I'm a really, I think a really good writer now, but I could be so much better or so much sooner if I had really taken time to do that. Yeah, it's, that's a good point. We do invest a lot in the writing program for our PPA students and also, you know, again, for our master's students at, and, and our undergrads, too. It, it makes a big difference. And, um, you know, probably there are other schools who don't quite spend as much uh, in, investment in that as we do. And I'm, I'm really glad we do. I do think it has pays many, many dividends for many years. If you can have that basic skill of really succinct and sharp writing. Um, you can use it in lots of lots of different areas. Um, actually, there's an audience question that, that probably um, 
David and I both need the answer to. We're, we're doing some thinking, as as are the other deans, about the what the future of PPIA should look like. It's had, you know, it's evolved over the years. Um, it's changed over the last forty years, and so maybe we'll put Farouk and Kanita on the spot for me and David. Um, if you all were thinking about the program and what you would hope to see for the for the future. What are the things you think that we might want to change or emphasize or focus on um, that we wouldn't have, you know, 20 years ago? I, well, one thing I, I, I don't know what the program is like now. It's been 19 years. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's evolved in very different um, from what it was back in 2002. I think one thing I can say is kind of um, a little bit of an emphasis on, I don't know how to correctly you know, put this in a term, but maybe sort of some of the softer skill, softer skills, maybe, uh -huh. or uh, so, for example, um, a focus on negotiations and learning how to mm -hmm. negotiate, um, sort of just, uh, you know, be working in an office and, you know, learning about sort of um, uh, organizational structure, um, mm -hmm. leadership development and skills and so that kind of a thing, that kind of thing. I know there's been a lot of, back back in 2002. We did a lot of, uh, we didn't really do any of that stuff at all. It was mostly you know coursework, policy focused, quantitatively focused mm -hmm. coursework. So I think that's one area um, that I would explore if it's not already being explored. That's great, Kanita. So yeah, so I would. I, like for I, I don't know what I don't know about what the program is actually doing now, um, but I could see if I were to see this in 40 years and I would come back 80 um, year old Kanita on a panel, um, I would hope to see um, more access to other schools like why uh -huh. is not at HBCUs at this point, mm -hmm. or it might be, I don't know if it's not, but I would love to see that. Um, I would love to see um, more leveraging of the alumni network, like the network mm -hmm. is powerful. Just even just who I'm on the panel with today, I'm like, wow, like what are we actually doing to leverage that, um, yeah. to make the program stronger, to um, help elevate the students out there, like just really leveraging that alumni network. Um, yeah, and, and just um, more touting of the program, just mm -hmm. general awareness about it. Like this is a fantastic program that yeah. people just kind of like me locked into um, those type of things. Yeah, I think those are those are great points. We would love to um, leverage the alumni network more and engage alumni. And as we're going to do after this call, we're going to have a uh, time for all of you and the other students and alumni to network together. Um, those of you who are listening on YouTube, you can look for instructions in the chat. And those of you who registered in advance, you can also see in the email you got um, for the call, it should give you instructions about how to, to log in for uh, the networking session for PPIA. I think it would be uh, wonderful to get more PPIA alumni involved in mentoring current students and, and each other. I mean, the peer network is... I think pretty um, pretty phenomenal. We are almost at time. Let me give each of you, you know, a brief moment for a last word and uh, start out, David. Uh, any any final thoughts for the group? My thoughts are just congratulations. You're already on the right path. Uh, this is uh, what the world needs: people committed to being in the trenches of doing the public's work and really uh, thinking about something higher than yourself. There's no greater reward than to, than to help society by, by giving back. Thank you, David. Kanita? So you would, th would have thought I would have been prepared to say, <laughs> to say your final <laughs> remark, but I'm just not at all. Um, I would just echo David, like congratulations um, on 40 years, looking forward and knowing that we will hit 40 more. Um, I think the work is critically important. Um, I think a lot of the issues that we see, um, you know, we don't need, you know, bad actors, malintent. Um, they are by and large a result of deliberate policy and choices that were made. And so we need to be attacking them at the policy level. And you all are through P PPIA um, charting that path for people to be thinking along those lines. And I just appreciate the work. Thank you, um, Kanita. Farouk? 
Uh, just two quick things. I just want to extend an offer to folks who are listening. If you are ever interested in the federal budget or appropriations process or national security, please reach out. I'm happy to connect uh, on LinkedIn or uh, if you want to get my information through somebody at the Ford School, I'm happy to share it. And then the second point I want to make is, uh, Dean Barr, please keep funding this program. I know you're all really supportive of it. Um, if you can be even more supportive of it, great. So that's all That's all I've got. Thanks. Thanks, Farouk. Uh, as I said, I, I love the program. I'm 100% committed to continuing it and really excited about it. And um, I hope you don't mind, I'll say shamelessly, as I did at the outset, that, you know, part of how we do this is through individual donations. It's hard to run the program. We don't have the funding for it. I have to scramble every year to raise the money. So um, anything anybody can do to help is in, in any size is always appreciated. And let me just close, as you all did, with a congratulations to our current students, uh, PPA students from around the country, and to our alumni PPA um, graduates uh just lovely to have you all here and thank you for helping us to mark this special moment the 40th year the 40th anniversary of the program i'm really proud of it i know david's proud of their program at goldman and and the handful of schools that have been involved since the start so it just really uh, delighted to have you all here and let me thank um farouk and kanita and david um, for joining us to to mark this occasion so thank you everybody and please do join for the um networking session right afterwards. Again, uh, you can look in your registration email or in the YouTube chat for instructions about how to join for that. But thanks very much.